Yeah, dear colleagues, friends and distinguished guests, it is a great pleasure for me to welcome all of you and I'm most grateful for the opportunity to speak here and exchange opinions and perspectives with you, especially in these times of pandemic crisis. The time ahead certainly holds a wealth of complex challenges, yet exchange and discussion continue unabated. Indeed, we can still take the time to enjoy being together, listening to each other and engaging in reflection together as we embrace the pleasure of impassionate debate and make sense of the world or elaborate fresh solutions to long-standing problems. This is one important reason why we are here today. What will the world be like after the crisis? How can we build a better world in hindsight? What lessons can we learn from the crisis? And what will be the role of gender equality in this overall endeavor that concerns us globally and touches upon our self-esteem as human beings? Finally, yet crucially, what measures will be appropriate to ensure the steady advancement of gender equality? I don't believe we have the answers to all of these questions yet, which makes it all the more important to bear them in mind as we jointly ponder our response to the pandemic crisis and the goal of achieving gender equality. Both tasks are challenging, but they also present us with opportunities. In the course of my talk, I hope to put forward more reasons for optimism, starting with some fundamental observations regarding the role of basic research in times of societal need. Basic research, societal challenges and gender equality to start with, let's remember what it is that we are improving when discussing the matters at hand. We are talking about science and the humanities, research and technology, areas of human endeavor that not only have the potential to enable countless simplifications and improvements in our lives, but also to be the key to our survival in this changing world. Where would we be today without the advances in biomedical research? And to take this idea a step further, as mentioned above, where would we be now without the curiosity of those scientists who started doing research into coronaviruses and the messenger RNA vaccination process all those years ago? Incidentally, the latter has its origins in cancer research and is yet another example of how later application contexts of a research projects are not necessarily foreseeable at the time of funding. One perfect case in point is the German company BioNTech, which was among the first to deliver an effective vaccine. The company was founded by Ugo Shahin, an excellent researcher whose fundamental work on messenger RNA-based vaccines was also funded by the DFG already 15 years ago. As we can see today, such research, both fundamental and outstanding, offers answers to questions that have not yet arisen and in some cases can't even be formulated at the time of funding. So, to generalize, funding research arising from independent curiosity lays the foundations for rapid yet reliable results, not only in the field of vaccine development, but also in relation to other research needs of the future. The current situation clearly demonstrates that the best way to prepare for new and unforeseeable societal changes, challenges, be they biomedical or other, is to generate 
a knowledge store that is not yet related to concrete problems, but rather to open questions. You can only produce a vaccine if you know the virus. So funding the intrinsic motivation and curiosity of researchers proves to be the earliest possible crisis prevention and the best way to build research infrastructures that contribute to resilient societies. Each year the DFG funds more than 30,000 basic research projects in all areas of the sciences and humanities. Every single one of these has the potential to become highly significant for society overnight, frequently within a complex societal, biological or technological context and often on a global scale. It might be the emergence, spread and increasing resistance of pathogens and people's susceptibility to them, or the consequences of climate change in the area of biology, the earth systems, politics or economics. <clears throat> and the often anthropogenic changes or to which our living environment is subject. Or finally, issues relating to migration and the scarcity of resources, religious and cultural tensions, political upheaval and armed conflict right through to the whole kaleidoscope of political and societal challenges resulting from digitalization. These issues continue to be highly urgent and we do not yet know which of them will keep us particularly busy in the coming year. Nor do we know which elements of the scientific, technological or social repertoire we will be able to draw on to provide a sustainable response. But thanks to our continuous research funding, we have more than 30,000 good reasons to be optimistic as we look ahead to the future. At the same time, all of the challenges mentioned have gender sensitive aspects and we do not know yet what precise form they will take. Some of these challenges may affect gender equality and diversity aspects in a positive or negative way, while others won't. Conversely, some of the challenges that lie ahead of us might even be driven by diversity aspects, while others won't. And some of them might boost diversity in entirely new ways. This is why it is vital for the research involved in analyzing and overcoming these challenges, not to reproduce time-worn patterns, but to reflect the most rigorous standards of diversity. Only then will it contribute actively to a more just world in which academia is able to inform societies in unexpected ways and help tackle future problems successfully. We can achieve this goal if we broaden our very concept and our understanding of how scientific ideas should be developed, instead of relying too often and too simply on binary criteria or fixed hierarchies when assessing research quality. Allow me to explain. Accomplishments such as the development of the corona vaccine depend on a complex interplay of many factors. How politics and society, science and research funding work together and to what extent all the available dimensions of diversity and the various combinations of ideas idea providers and procedures can be activated to create something that is genuinely new. Here again, the pandemic is a prime example of the complexity of research contexts. Initial voices 
from the field of medicine were quickly expanded to include mathematical modeling, successive input was added from the field of economics, law assessments were made of fundamental rights and a wide variety of issues emerged in the areas of sociology. Also of psychology and education that continue to occupy us to this day. Flow research was involved in the investigation of aerosol dispersion at an early stage. So indeed of demanding often very far-reaching statements from individual scientists, professional communities or interdisciplinary expert committees should be asked to provide more comprehensive assessments. This is why the DFG set out the interplay of these various dimensions early on when setting up its interdisciplinary commission for research on pandemics. To sum up, fostering multidisciplinarity and involving all players of the research ecosystem, both in and beyond academia, are crucial aspects when it comes to building effective research infrastructures. What makes such infrastructures so highly productive is that they are relatively open towards new and unexpected ideas, which is precisely the mindset we need in order to build innovation systems that are inclusive rather than exclusive. So, in my view, the best possible research happens when researchers are funded based on their excellence and no one should be excluded from a career in research based on academically irrelevant factors such as gender, ethnic origin, class, age or health. Even though the advantages of equal participation in the research system are widely known, a considerable proportion of the academic talent pool and therefore the innovation potential available still remains unused. Excellent research requires diversity and originality to ensure long-term engagement with all socially relevant areas and groups. It is crucial that these are adequately represented in academia. The question is how we can tackle this problem effectively. Now, one key aspect is to reach out to those who recruit staff at the research performing institutions. Our university appointment committees, for example, there is sometimes a lack of awareness of equal opportunities. In some cases, stereotypes, unconscious bias and hidden agreements persist. To some extent, this may be true for the review process in such areas as research funding as well. One way the DFG addresses those problems is by publishing its Code of Conduct entitled Guidelines for Safeguarding Good Scientific Practice, which also contains procedures and measures to promote equal opportunity and prevent the abuse of power. Such questions of organizational governance gain in urgency given the severe circumstances of research due to the pandemic. What we see is that the effects of a lockdown, in particular the lack of childcare facilities, impact researchers differently. For example, women publish less during the times of crisis. The so-called gender publication gap is in effect exacerbated by the so-called corona publication gap, as indicated by initial data. In response to enable short-term relief on gender equality issues. For example, 